This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV. The Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA member FDIC. Terms apply. Level up your listening with Bose Quiet Comfort Ultra Earbuds and Headphones with immersive sound and world class noise cancellation for a not so silent night. Visit Bose.com slash Spotify to shop sound that's more than a present. This episode is brought to you by Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business. Want to advance your career or switch fields? An MBA from Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business can help. Earn your degree from a top-ranked business school with a thought-provoking curriculum, one-on-one leadership coaching, support from experienced career counselors, and full-time online hybrid and accelerated MBA formats. Join the intelligent future. Visit cmu.edu slash Tepper to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Klaviyo, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Klaviyo, you can activate all your customer data in real time, connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels, guide your marketing strategy with AI-powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance, deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale, and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Klaviyo. Learn more at klaviyo.com slash Spotify. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash Spotify. It's time to say goodbye to hold music and say hello to fast customer support with Service Cloud. With trusted AI and data working together, you can skip long wait times and deliver efficient, personalized service right away, all while keeping support costs low and more customers happy. Reimagine your customer support with the number one AI CRM for service. Learn what's possible at salesforce.com slash products slash service. Welcome to the HCI family of podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Welcome to the podcast. In this podcast episode, I talk with David Noble about real time and three dimensional leadership. David Noble, welcome to the conversation today. Thanks, John. Good to be here. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from upstate New York. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about real-time leadership and three-dimensional leadership. I'm super fascinated by these topics. I'm thrilled to have someone with your expertise and experience on the show with me to explore these together. As we get started, I wanted to share David's bio with everybody. David Noble is a coach and strategist who works with CEOs and their teams, investors, and star athletes. Named by Thinkers 50 last month as one of the world's top eight coaches, he is also a senior advisor to the Institute of Coaching affiliated with Harvard Medical School and to Egan Zender, the Global Talent Consultancy. Previously, David was a managing partner in strategy consulting and was a senior operating executive in financial services, including a role as CEO of the world's first digital bank. He is co-author of Real-Time Leadership, How to Find Your Winning Moves When the Stakes Are High. And I could say a whole lot more about your background, David, but I'm going to pause there. Anything else you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? 
Thanks, John. Um, just to mention that as part of my leadership philosophy and coaching philosophy, I look at things from a systems point of view. So mm -hmm. I think I've been able to benefit from my background as an operating executive, as mm -hmm. well as a strategist, and then more recently as a leadership advisor and theorist. Wonderful. And I think systems perspective, systems thinking, and systems analysis is is critical whenever we're talking about the pressing issues that are facing teams and organizations. Uh, so I appreciate that as a kind of foundational principle and uh, approach that you take in your work. All right, David, as we get started, uh, perhaps we can start by just defining some things. So what do you mean by real-time leadership and what do you th mean by three-dimensional leadership? Sure. Great question. So let me um, leg into that. So when you think about it today, we're getting bombarded by more and more things thrown at us, both opportunities and threats than we've ever seen before. If you look at trying to measure that, Accenture took a shot at that by creating what they call their global disruption index. And that's trying to assess geopolitical change, macroeconomic change, mm -hmm. technology, consumer, and the like. And what they found was that between 2011 and 2016, the index hardly moved at all. It was high, but it hardly moved at all. Then between 2017 and 2022, the five-year period that we've just been through, it doubled. Tis the season to shine with H&M. Discover the holiday collection and find fashionable pieces for your wardrobe or for under the tree. Get inspired and dazzle with this year's glam. From tuxedo styles, bow detailed pieces, impressive prints, and more. From unforgettable looks to unforgettable gifts. With fashion finds to home decor, find it all at H&M. Treat your loved ones and yourself this season. Shop in-store or at hm.com. So when you think about that, we have a lot of competition for our cognitive attention as leaders. And when you can also think about the act of leadership, it happens in the now, in the present. It really doesn't happen in the past. It doesn't happen in the future. So when you combine all that with all the stuff that's being thrown at us that we need to deal with, plus leadership unfolding in, that, in the now, for me, real-time leadership is about how do you make the most of every minute as a leader, whether it's taking a split-second decision or whether you're working on some kind of goal for this fiscal quarter, or this calendar year, or even a lifetime. So how do you make the most of every moment? Well, I really like that. And of course, we, like you said, we're in a day and an age where the, the rate and pace of change is just dramatic. Um, we've all lived it the last several years during the pandemic and, and coming out of the pandemic. Um, but it's not just the pandemic. It's like all the other things layered on top of it. And it's just caused a lot of upheaval and a lot of disruption, whether it be social, political, economic, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so having that real time perspective, um, built on a foundation of systems thinking and systems perspective, I think is, is really, really important. Uh, now what do you mean by the three dimensions, the three dimensional leadership? Sure. So um, when you think about how do I make the most of every minute as a leader, what I've found is that most good leaders tend to rely on the pattern recognition that they've formed over years of experience. So if they mm -hmm. see A and they see B, then they know that C is the right answer. And that's worked in a relatively stable environment. But when we're getting new stuff that's thrown at us, it could lead you in exactly the wrong direction to make a reflex. And e even yeah. if you do reflex in day-to-day -day environments, you're not getting any better as a leader. You're just repeating the same thing over and over again. So for me, the first step to um, leadership is how do you know how and when to overcome those reflexes? So you need to create a space so that you don't, um, you have a stimulus and you don't react. You have a stimulus and you respond. And then when you respond, you need to step into peak performance leadership, which is three-dimensional leadership. So an example is uh, we all know leaders who are one-dimensional. So those are the ones who will hit every target out of the park, but they'll run over their people to get it done. We know people who are wonderful servant leaders who want the best for their people, but they actually find it hard to hold them accountable as a result. And we all know people who are individual subject matter experts who are wonderful in their own way, but individual producers, and they find it hard to relate to other humans. <laughs> so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. leadership is showing up as a whole person, both in terms of first, the external dimension, that's the first dimension. And that's 
am I absolutely crystal clear on what needs to be done in this moment? What is a win in this moment? Again, we want to make sure that we're spending our time on the things that matter most. The second dimension is who we are internally. It's who it's what we emanate is as important as what we say and what we do as leaders. So that's like, what character strengths do I have? What do I project into this situation? And what should I be working on on my growth edge? A lot of leaders need to work on their patience, for example. A lot of leaders need to work on listening, things like that. But it might be generosity, kindness, empathy, whatever it is. What is it that you need to work on in your inner dimension? And then the third dimension, once you know what you need to get done, who you want to be while you're doing it, is how can I best relate to others? And for us, or for Carol and me, my my co-author, it's not about how I want to relate to other people. It's about how they want and need me to relate to them so we can unlock things together. So that's three-dimensional leadership. Yeah, and I want to touch on each of those in turn. Excuse me. Uh, But perhaps let's start with that last one first. Um, Another way of saying what you just said, instead of the golden rule, we talk about the platinum rule, right? Exactly. That we want to make sure that we're we're meeting people where they're at in a way that they're going to be able to hear what we have to say, where they're going to be able to receive, you know, the feedback that we give, uh, all of those sorts of things. And, you know, how I want it, you know, how I, how I want and prefer to be dealt with doesn't actually matter all that much when I'm working with those around me, um, because people have wide varieties of preference, styles, personality, you know, all those things really impact how people engage with those around them. And it's, there's no right or wrong really to it. Uh, I mean, I suppose there are instances where, you know, you're, you're handling things in the wrong way, but generally speaking, we're just talking about difference. We're just talking about style difference or preference difference or whatever. And so just meeting people where they're at and becoming comfortable with getting out of your comfort zone in a way that you can engage with those around you in a way that's going to matter to them. That's going to be salient and resonate with them is really, really important. And you're right. I think a lot of leaders are kind of one trick ponies. They're they are really good at one of the three. Um, mm-hmm. But unless you can really start to cobble together a combination of at least a couple of those things, um, if not all three, and then surround yourself with other people who are really good at the things you might defi- be deficient in, you're going to struggle in the long term uh, in trying to accomplish the types of things that need to be accomplished with your team. You are. And it might seem like a big step to um, be a three-dimensional leader, but I think there are some things that you can do in literally no extra time that can help Mm -hmm. you get there. So for the first dimension, the goals that you have, you can ask yourself, is this really my goal? Is this the most important thing I can be doing right now in this moment? Is it to get this thing approved at my next meeting, or is it to have everyone have a voice in that meeting so we can uh, come to a better decision? Second dimension about who do you want to be um, in this moment is like, just ask yourself, if you're the person that's sitting in traffic, do you want to be the one leaning on the horn and giving everyone else the finger? (laughs) Or do you want to be accepting what's happening and making the most of it in that moment? So just ask yourself, who do I want to be right now? And then the last one is um, just from your reaction or interactions with other people, how is your tone landing with them? So, you know, are their eyes glazing over or are they not saying a word? You know, you're not interacting very well there. So understanding like what they need from you is just to ask them, how's that landing with you? How does that feel? Going back to the the first one, the external or thinking about the goals, um, uh, the the KPIs, the, you know, being results driven. Again, I, I want to work with individuals who are results driven. I I want to work with a leader who is results driven. Um, But there's a difference between, as you mentioned, someone who, who goes after results, you know, at any cost, uh, and the ends justify the means, and they walk all over everyone around them, and they exploit people left and right. There's no trust there. There's no commitment there uh, within the team. And generally, that will you know, you might be able to produce good results in the short term, but in the long term, you're going to lose all your best people. No one's going to trust you and and your performance is going to stagnate. So that's really not a viable approach if that is solely how you go about your leadership. Um, yet it's one that I see a lot of leaders take. Uh, and, and I understand it, like they're feeling the pressure, you know, most 
leaders have someone they're reporting to, unless you are like the, the owner of the business and you don't have shareholders or anything, like, unless that's the case, you answer to people. And when you're answering to people, uh, you feel pressure. And so I get it. I get why people will sometimes cut corners to get the results. I understand why people sometimes step on people to get results. Um, but you just need to recognize that when you do that, you're undermining your own long-term ability to be effective as a leader. And uh, you're, you're just sacrificing long-term success for short-term gains that are not real gains in the first place, uh, because ultimately what you did to get them uh, isn't going to prove effective uh, moving forward. Yeah. And I think some people just misread what their mandate is. So they think sure. they're leaning in to drive results. And um, it's fine to lean in. Leaning in means that you are uh, you have a conviction about something, you have a point of view, you're going to take a decision, you're going to move things forward. That's all fine, but it's how you do that. And you don't have to be uh, like you're driving a tank. You can lean mm -hmm. in with empathy. You can lean in with a sense of humor. You can lean in with generosity. There's so many different ways to lean in to get that done. And that's where the other dimensions of leadership come in. Yeah. And I'm thinking right now, as we move into the second one uh, a little bit more, I'm thinking of, of of an organization, multiple people within the same organization um, who who tend to have different strengths in these areas. And I'm thinking of one person who's kind of the steamroller, mm -hmm. get stuff done at all costs kind of a person. Um, and they're a bit of a nightmare, like people don't like working with them. Mm -hmm. And, and there's there's repercussions for for their approach. But then on the flip side, I, I think of another um, executive in this organization. And my goodness, this guy, he's the nicest guy. He's a servant leader. People love him. But man, he doesn't get anything done. <laughs> and so like on the flip side, like, you know, people get a little bit frustrated because they're like, nothing's actually moving forward and things are stalling. And there's, you know, it's 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 wonderful to be nice and kind and people treat people with uh, treat people with dignity and respect, but you also want to get stuff done. You also need to have some sort of, you know, political savvy within the organization. You have to be able to know how to navigate difficult uh, conversations. Uh, and you can't just always move forward with, you know, feeling good all the time and everyone liking you all the time. That's just not how it works. Right. And so I think in both of those cases, you know, I, I see leaders who have potential. I see leaders who in some ways are doing a good job. And I see uh, a lot of room for growth in both of those individuals. Now that's mm -hmm. not to say, I mean, I'm, I'm pointing out, you know, these two examples that just come to the top of my head. Of course, we all have those areas that we need to work on. And so it's not unique to them. I think every leader has things they need to, to work on for sure. Um, but that, that was just a stark example in my mind. And it really is limiting both of their uh, potential and both of their opportunity to really have the type of impact I know they want to have. Uh, they're both good people. They're both, you know, well-meaning and they both have vastly different kind of approaches and strategies. And it, it, it causes some, some uh, problems, some, some friction. And, and that's, you know, hopefully as we move into that third dimension and you start to couple these first two and you move into that third dimension, you start to recognize um, where other people are coming from a little bit more. And that's where you can really start to hone your ability across these areas. Uh, you mentioned earlier as well uh, with the reflective process, like it doesn't take a whole lot of time. It doesn't take any like money. It just takes, you know, a little bit of, of self-awareness and a little bit of uh, reflective energy uh, to think about where you're at? Are those the goals that you want? Are you being the person you want to be? Are you interacting with people the way they like to be interacted with? Um, fairly simple, straightforward questions. If we just get into that daily habit of asking ourselves those, reflecting as we're walking from meeting to meeting, how did that last meeting go? You know, think through those questions. That that you know, if you start to do that consistently and build some muscle memory around that, my goodness, I think that alone could move people. Uh, remarkably forward. Yeah. It's all about cultivating an intention to be a three-dimensional leader and then activating that intention through those simple questions. And it's, it's all about expanding our leadership range at the end of the day. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is moving outside of our reflex because my reflex might be to be a servant leader. My reflex mm -hmm. might be to lean in all the time. And those are all appropriate strategies, just not all the time. So right. you've got to cultivate more agility 
to um, to be able to step into what you need to do as a leader. Yeah, that agility piece, I think, is, is critical. And that really gets to the last main point I wanted to explore with you today um, around creating options, generating options for success. Because we're in a, a rapidly changing world, the, the landscape of work is shifting. Um, being a leader today, being an effective leader today is not the same thing as being an effective leader even five years ago, uh, certainly not 10 years ago or, or you know, a generation ago. And so we need to be thinking through um, and, and really scenario planning and thinking through different mm-hmm. options for how we can face the challenges ahead of us fully recognizing we don't actually know what those challenges are going to be um but as we start to get into the habit of getting past the mu- the muscle memory like you mentioned earlier where you just kind of get into the habit of just responding a certain way because you're used to seeing x and now you're doing y but but recognizing hey there's going to be a variety of approaches that i'm going to have to consider um now let's talk an, about that a little bit more and unpack that why is it critical for leaders today to be able to generate options and how can they go about doing that? Sure. Great question. So I find that um, most good leaders have always identified a pathway to a win. So they've got a goal in mind and they've got a way to get there. And that's just not good enough anymore Mm. because we've all got so many obstacles and roadblocks thrown in our way. You need more than one pathway to win. So ideally you'd have four or more pathways. And this is anchored in, um, uh, evidence-based frameworks called hope theory, mm-hmm. but it's the more avenues that we've got to get to our path, the more confident we are, the more likely mm-hmm. we are to actually get there. So a couple of examples. One is just um, in terms of, uh, let's say I need to get to a financial target um, this quarter. And my instinct, my default might be, yeah, the way I usually roll is I'm going to make a bunch of fast moves, but they're going to be really small, but together they're going to aggregate into something really meaningful and I'll hit the target that way. Okay. That's one pathway to a win. Now let's say you don't have that option that you have to move in a different way. So, oh, maybe I'm going to do something that's very big, top down and strategic. Maybe I'm going to do something that's more intuition driven than data because I don't have all the data on hand. That's a way to create multiple options to go at that target. Where it shows up in a really interesting way is in that platinum rule for relating to other people. So um, Carol and I created this um, notion of four stances to relate to people. So the first one, lean in, which is what we all know about. It's like, I'm going to take a point of view, take a decision, move things ahead. Fine. The other strategy is lean back. So it's like, you know what? I don't have quite enough information right now. I need to gather more data. I need to ask more people. I need to get different opinions. It's not paralysis analysis. It could verge into that, but there are some situations where you just need that. A third option or stance is leaning with someone. That's people first. So that's where it's like, hey, I know we can do this. I've got your back. We're all in this together. We got you. And then the last stance, which is the most difficult for all leaders, is not leaning at all. It's like letting something (laughs) go by you, right? Uh Or letting your intuition come to you. Because you know what? Maybe the world is going to take care of this. The universe will provide. Or maybe your team will take care of this before you jump on it. So the thing is, we all tend to have one default strategy that we over over rely on. And what you want to do is cultivate all four. And here's a quick example of it. Um, so let's just say, I know you wouldn't do this, but let's say I'm on this <laughs> podcast and I can see you roll your eyes and sneer at me. Okay. <laughs> so four different options for playing that first option is leaning in. It's like, Hey John, what was all that about? I saw that what's going on with you. Okay. That's a possible strategy. Another strategy is leaning back and it's like, I wonder what's going on with John. Like, was there something I said that was going on, you know, something that's going on with his day, something that was bothering him? I wonder what's going on. Third option is leaning with. It's like, oh, my gosh, I've offended John. I need to make him feel better. And then the fourth one is just to go like, um, John who? I'm going to keep going and make my point. (laughs) <laughs> so all those strategies, right? But we typically would go to one of those strategies, depending mm-hmm. on who you are. And this is about creating that 
um, new muscle so that you can actually use all four stances. Because in most conversations, like I might start out with you, even in a tough conversation by leaning with you and just going, John, I really care about you. And we're going to work through this together. And then I might ask you some questions about, you know, what was your thinking around this? And then I might lean in and go like, this is what we got to do now. So it's like all four stances are usually operative in any kind of really meaningful substantive conversation. We just want to get better at managing those stances. Yeah. Well, and I really like that emphasis and acknowledgement that even in a single conversation with somebody, you likely will need to be effective in using each of those stances. Uh, and so a lot of times we think, well, yeah, different context, different scenario, I might need to use a different one. The reality is a lot of times you're going to be using all of them. And certainly within a given day as a leader with a team, with different people, you're going to be needing to utilize all of those consistently, right? Yep. And, and likely within even the same conversation, as you mentioned. And so just learning to uh, to take a step back when we have our initial reaction of how we feel like we should respond, um, I think is that first step, like you mentioned earlier, uh, so that we can just know where we're coming from and understand what's showing up for us before we start to project stuff onto other people, right? Or we start to only approach them in a particular way. Um, you know, that's half the battle is is right there. Just making sure that you're aware of what's happening within you and how your, your general response is. Um, you know, I had an instance... Uh, fairly recently, it was probably a month ago or so. Um, and I, I 100% had my gut reaction to, to a conversation um, where, you know, I was, it was kind of a mix of one and four <laughs> of what you just described. <laughs> and, you know, and it, it, why did I respond that way? Uh, you know, because I've had past experience with this person uh, because of other stuff going on in my life, uh, for whatever reason, you know, I just, I felt, you know, that that was the appropriate way to respond in the moment. And it wasn't until I took a little bit of time to reflect on that interaction and understand, Hey, that wasn't actually all that effective. Mm -hmm. What just happened there that I realized that yes, on the one hand, maybe I was right. Maybe the way I was responding, you know, fit. Okay. Given the circumstances, given the history, et cetera. But I also, short-circuited any uh, opportunity to have a successful resolution <laughs> by, by, by the way I responded, um, you know, and maybe it wouldn't have worked anyways. Maybe if I had taken a, a, a more effective approach, maybe the outcome wouldn't have been what I wanted anyways, but, you know, it would have been an opportunity to build a little bit more rapport, a little bit more trust. And, and I didn't do that. Right. So it was a missed opportunity. Um, you know, I, I, I see those types of experiences happen to me um, more often than I would like to admit. And I suspect we all do. I, I think that's just kind of the, the, the nature of the human experience. We're not perfect at how we interact with each other. Um, nobody's expecting perfection. And so it's just a matter of making sure that we're taking the time to reflect and, and try to do a little bit better the next time. Um, try a different approach. Be like, be very purposeful about, okay, today I'm meeting with this person. We're having this coaching conversation. I'm going to make a point of actually trying these other uh, approaches that I normally wouldn't uh, defer to uh, and, and get some practice with it. It'll, it'll make all the difference in the world. Yeah. You just a great example. You can unpack these things and reflect in, uh, in the rearview mirror, like you just did. Mm -hmm. You can do it in real time by just, you know, set your phone to buzz in the middle of a conversation. And when it buzzes, ask yourself, is this going the way that mm -hmm. I would like to go? And it gives you another chance to pull it out. And then looking ahead in the future, anticipate where you're going to have a high stakes conversation and figure out like, who do you want to be in that conversation? Yeah. Yeah. Well, David, this has just been a great conversation. I know at the time I need to let you go here in just a minute, but before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, where they can find your book, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, you can learn more about me at www.davidnoble.org. Um, you can also just um, type in to your favorite search engine, real-time leadership, and you'll find a way to buy the book. And uh, I would just invite you to, um, to scan the book, take a look at what really speaks to you, 
And there are some things that could be game changers that really require no extra time. And then there's mm-hmm. some things that really require you to do a deeper dive and the book will equip you to do that. So I just encourage you to take a look and thank you. Wonderful. David, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what David can do for you. Check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. They can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.